This is David Harding. Because of the importance of tonight's counter-spy case, following our dramatization, there will be a special message from the Vice President of the United States of interest to all Americans. Pepsi-Cola, P-E-P-S-I. That's your smartest cola buy. Pepsi-Cola presents Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Harding, Counter Spy, calling Washington... United States counter spies, especially appointed to investigate and combat the enemies of our country, both at home and abroad. Tonight, the case of a courageous come on. Another counter spy report to the American people, brought to you each Tuesday and Thursday by Pepsi Cola. Pepsi Cola, it's a spot. Two full glasses, that's a lot. That's right, you heard what they said. Two full glasses of sparkling Pepsi from one big 12 ounce bottle. You're getting an extra glass full. And what a delicious glass full. The most refreshing, delightful cola that ever tickled your taste. You can't top Pepsi's tangy flavor. And that big, big bottle saves you money. Goes twice as far. Pepsi is America's big, big favorite. And America's biggest cola value. So why take less when Pepsi is best? Whenever you reach for refreshment, remember... Why take less when Pepsi is best? And now, to Counter Spy. It is a scene truly out of the Old West. A dance and gambling hall crowded with hard-riding, fast-shooting men enjoying themselves, but at any moment ready for action. Suddenly, the swinging doors fly open. A tall, languid cowpoke stands framed in them. The crowd quiets down as the cowpoke ambles to the bar and stops in front of a well-dressed, shifty-eyed man. Well, dude, it's sundown, and I'm still in town. You don't take advice easy, Steve Morgan. I'm choosy about whose advice I take, dude. I don't like yours. I give you five seconds to draw. Now, look, Steve, you don't want to... Okay, okay, that's it. Cut, cut. Camera will print that take. All right, boys, clear the set so we can do the fight scene next. Oh, Gary. Gary. Well, how did it go, my great director? Okay? Swell, swell. Great, strong jaw stuff. Uh, Thanks. Uh, You've got a visitor, Gary. Dr. Hobart Whalen. This is Gary Marlowe, Steve Morgan in this picture we're shooting. Well, how do you do, Mr. Marlowe? It's quite a thrill meeting you in person after seeing you in so many films. Well, thank you, Doctor. You... May I present my assistant, James Dover? Oh, well, hello, Mr. Dover. I... Oh, it's all right, Mr. Marlowe. I can shake hands with my left. Get used to it after being without a right arm a couple of years. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't notice. It's okay. Everyone spots a leg for it. Mr. Marlowe, is there somewhere we could talk privately? Why, my dressing room. Just follow me. To get to the point, Mr. Marlowe, I'm heading the Institute for Disabled Workers, and we're embarking on a large fundraising campaign. Well, maybe I'd better save your time, Dr. Whalen. All my charitable contributions are handled by my business manager. We're not looking for charity, Mr. Marlowe. Jimmy. Why is it every time you guys see somebody without an arm or a leg, you think of tin cups and beck? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought... Sure, that... I know you thought we're looking for a handout. Charity, huh? Did you ever take any, Mr. Marlowe? It sticks in your craw. Jimmy, you... You better wait outside. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Doctor. Believe me, Mr. Dover, I didn't my mean... My fault, Mr. Marlowe. I fly off the handle too easy. Uh, Wait outside, Jimmy. I'll finish our business with Mr. Marlowe. All right, Doctor. I'm sorry again. I'm always being sorry. Doctor, I didn't mean to hurt him. No one does. You see, Mr. Marlowe, 
That's what my institute is for. To educate the public to the abilities of disabled people. To accept a man, minus an arm and a leg like Jimmy, for instance, as a man, not a cripple. Dr. Wayland, any way I can help you, I will. Well, thank you, Mr. Marlowe. You can by a contribution. Not of your money, but of your time. Yes? A month from now, we're holding a benefit in New York City. It's to raise money to set up a chain of industrial and liberal arts schools for the disabled. So they, so they can become self-employed. A month from now, you said? Yes. Now, I'd like you, the famous Western film star, to be our master of ceremonies. We'll have a full program of stars and celebrities... Why, I think I can do it, Dr. Whalen. I'll have to clear it with my agent in my studio, but that should be simple. Splendid, Mr. Marlowe. Thanks for your cooperation. I'll have my secretary, Miss Vicki Brent, call you for a final confirmation. Good day, sir. To David Harding, United States Counter Spies, Washington, from United States and Screen Actors Union pursuant to Tax Bureau Memorandum. This is to notify you that members of our union are being solicited to appear at a benefit performance for the Institute for the Disabled. Dr. Hobart Whalen, Director. We are notifying our members they may appear unless you notify us to the contrary. Mr. Harding, the telegram just came in for you. Let's see, Peter. Oh, yes. What's it all about? Oh, that's right. You were out of town on the Horn case when this memorandum was issued. I must have been. I don't know what it refers to. Charity benefit performances. The tax bureau has been having trouble with them. Oh? How? Well, in some instances, the tax regulations allow entertainers to deduct contributions of their services to charity just as if they had donated cash. But there were a number of benefits last year that were nothing but highly organized rackets. Oh, I get it. The tax people wouldn't allow the deductions for playing those benefits. That's right. So we've worked out an arrangement with them and the various entertainers' unions. They notify us of scheduled benefits. We make a routine investigation. Do the sponsors of the benefits know about it? Not if we give them a clean bill of health. And if we don't? No benefit. Unless they want to promote one for themselves in the penitentiary. Fine. For once, we get a chance to stop a crime before it's committed. That's about it. So put this institute and this Dr. Hobart Whalen through a routine investigation, then we can forget it. Unless, of course, it turns out to be not routine. Yes, Mr. Marlowe? Well, this is Dr. Whalen's secretary. I'll give him your message just as soon as he gets back here to the office. And we'll see you in New York in a month. Goodbye. The great Gary Marlowe, huh, Vicky? Yes, Jimmy. He says he'll MC the benefit performance. Wonderful. You're not very enthusiastic about it, are you, Jimmy? Sorry, Vicky, I've got the blues. Vicky, Jimmy, I have splendid news, splendid news. What is it, Dr. Whalen? Well, I've just talked to the management of Coliseum Hall in New York by transcontinental phone. They're going to let us have the hall for our benefit for just expenses. They're giving up their usual profit. That's wonderful, Doctor. Isn't it, Jimmy? Yeah, great. Well... What's the matter? Ah, uh, Jimmy's a little down in the dumps today. Oh? Doctor, it, it, it's just that I haven't been doing anything. Just hanging around, acting like a pitch to soften people up. I walk in, they took a look at me, and they go woozy. And Well, I can't stand the pity in their eyes when they see what the war did to me. I know how you feel, boy. That's why your job is the toughest of all. Yeah? Because you've got to stand that pity. The misplaced pity of a lot of well-meaning people. You've got to do that so we can break the ground and educate them to know that you don't need pity. We've got to show people that a boy like you is well able to take care of himself. Show them in a dramatic manner that they'll never forget. Maybe you're right, Doc. Of course I am. Now, I just made train reservations to New York. You go down to the station and get those tickets. On the double. And don't tell me that you can't do that with one leg. I know you better. Okay, Dr. Wayland. Sorry. On a double. Vicky, think I set the boy straight? No question about it. Funny thing is, every word I said was true. And you didn't mean a single one. The important thing is, he thinks I did. Yeah, he does. Now, what's the matter with you, Vicky? Him. Him? You falling for that half-man? Shut up. Now, 
wouldn't it? I'm working this con game with you. That doesn't mean I have to like it. What about on this sudden distaste? I just got a mental picture of Jimmy when he finds out that you and I are phony. Really? Was he heartbroken? Why don't Albert you... Albert, tears were streaming down his face. Touching sight. Doc, what do you use for a heart? A pump composed of animal tissue like every other human being. Don't flatter yourself. All right, I'll change that. Like every other animal in the jungle you call civilization. Doc. The survival of the fittest. The strong eat the weak. I'm strong, Vicky. The kid's a sucker. In fact, he's a cripple doesn't change that. Simply makes him better bait to lure on the healthy suckers. Okay, Doc. No lectures. Whatever you say, Vicky. Just don't turn into a sucker yourself. It's a little late for me to change sides, I guess. That's right. So snap out of it, Vicky. Two more days, we head for New York. Jimmy, sure, the door's not locked. I thought you'd be in the club car. Got my own club car. Right here in my own compartment. Oh. Well, I see. Uh, do you get train sick? Is that why? No, I just like a drink now and then. Nothing wrong with that, is it? Oh, of course not, Vicky. If you want me to go... Why should I want you to go? Sit down. Look at the scenery. It goes by. I've just been talking to Dr. Whalen. Dr. Whalen. That calls for another drink. You want one? Vicky, don't you think you've had enough? I've had enough of something, but it's not this. Okay. What you looking at? The countryside. Oh. Makes me kind of ashamed of myself. You ashamed? Look at it, Vicky. Wide and rolling. Those wheat fields... Pretty in the sun, aren't they? So pretty. The doctor's right. The doctor? Oh, yes, Dr. Wade. Vicky. Vicky, I've decided something. Th- this country is big enough for everything, everybody. The, the mountains we went through. The, the plains will be rolling over soon. There's-, there's room in it for every man, even a guy like me, a half. Sorry, Vicky. The doc told you that, huh? Yeah, but I added something of my own. Vicky, this country is big, but it needs me. I'm alive. I, I've got something to give it. Me and a million other men and women like me. The trouble is, it's kind of slow to wake up to the fact. Sort of stupid. But I'm going to help smarten it up. You are. Sure, Vicky, and you too. Mm. You know something, Jimmy? You know who's stupid? No, Vicky, who? You, you're stupid, stupid, stupid. Oh, and a sucker. Oh, what a sucker. You're not a strong one. You're not like the doc. You're not like me. Strong ones. That's me. Vicky, what are you talking about? And the about? doc. Ah, the doc. He couldn't even give you a prescription to buy a bandage in a drugstore. Oh, Vicky, snap No, on. you listen to me. Tell you a beautiful story about a rat. A pretty rat. You think I'm pretty, don't you, Jim? Now, Vicky, makes sense. I wish I didn't. I wish I didn't, but I do. Jimmy, our organization is a phony, and the doc is a phony, and I'm a phony. What are you saying? What am I saying? I'm down off that crutch of yours. And I'll tell you. <laughs> Operator. I'm in a railroad station. I only have eight minutes. I don't know the number, but I've got to talk to Countess by headquarters in Washington, D.C. Mr. David Hardy. Mr. Peters, call Mr. Harding right away. Mr. Peters, call Mr. Harding right away. This is Peters, Dave. Yes, Peters. Has anything come in on the investigation of that benefit for the disabled? No, Chief. You said it was just routine. Well, it's not routine anymore. Bring whatever you've got to my office. We've got to go to work. Fast. Back to Counter Spy in just a moment. But first, 
Pepsi Cola, hit the spot. Two full glasses, that's a lot. Lots more value, lots more zest. Why take less when Pepsi's best? More and more, among fellows and girls, among mothers and dads, you hear that sane and sensible question. Why take less when Pepsi's best? No budget, no allowance ever had a better friend than tangy, sparkling Pepsi Cola. Because one big 12 ounce Pepsi bottle gives you two delicious drinks. That's twice as much tangy taste. Twice as much delicious Pepsi to go just twice as far. That's why more and more families say, why take less when Pepsi's best? Yes, families like yours and mine. Families all over America. They're all saying, why take less when Pepsi's best? Pepsi Cola hits the spot. Tastes terrific when you're hot. More and better than the rest. Why take less when Pepsi's best? Today, tomorrow, always get America's biggest cola value. Take home a carton of six big, big Pepsi bottles. Insist on Pepsi at the store and say Pepsi at the fountain. Say Pepsi at the stand. Say Pepsi. Whenever you reach for refreshment, remember... Why take less when Pepsi's best? And now, back to Counter Spy. E. Brent are in a corridor of a large New York hotel. Jimmy raises his good arm to knock on the door of room 302, then pauses. Sure you want to go through with the city? I'm sure. Get a girl. Come in. Come on. Mr. Hardy? That's right, Mr. Dover. Come in. Sit down. Uh, this is Miss Vicki Brent I told you about. Yes. Won't you sit down, Miss Brent? Oh, yeah, yeah thanks. Well, why not sit back, Miss Brent? You don't look very comfortable perched on the edge of that chair. I'm a little nervous. No, no. It's all right, Vicki. Uh, this is my assistant, Mr. Peters. Miss Brent, Mr. Dover. Brent? Hey, Dover, Hello. Mr. Peters. Dover. Now, Mr. Dover, let's listen to you. What about this phony benefit you called me about? Well, I uh, told you about Dr. Wayland and my part in it. Uh, sketchily, yes. Well, we've already investigated Wayland. He has a long record as a confidence man and a chiseling promoter. Well, I, I think Vicki, uh, I mean, Miss Brent can give you a better picture of the setup than I can. Well, Miss Brent? First, Mr. Harding, I want to get one thing straight. Yes? Jimmy's got a little blind spot about me. This isn't the first fake deal I've been in. The doc didn't con me into it. I knew what it was all about from the start. I'm glad you said that, Miss Brent. It's a good beginning. What? We've been looking you up, too. Peter, Victoria Brent, alias Barry, alias Brandon. Indicted for racetrack swindle, suspended sentence. Indicted as suspect in fur theft, probation, and some more. I couldn't have hidden it if I wanted to. Well, the important thing is you didn't want to. Now, will you tell your story? Well, Doc Whalen got the idea to promote this benefit for disabled people. He called me in on the deal, and I went for it. Mm hmm Jimmy was hired by the doc, and the doc gave him a song and dance about useful work and what a great project it was, make the people aware of the ableness of the disabled. Then I went for it, hook, line, and sinker. No reason you shouldn't, Mr. Dover. It's a great idea. I'm keeping that in mind. Go ahead, Miss Brent. Well, with Jimmy to go around with them and soften them up, the doc promoted half the big names in Hollywood. They'd... Well... Say it, Vicky. They'd take one look at me and drown in their own pity. I'm sorry, Jimmy. And now we're supposed to pull the same stunt with the Broadway and radio stars, only I'm not supposed to know that's what it is. We'll come back to that, Jimmy. Go on, Miss Brent. The doc set up a phony outfit. The Institute for the Disabled. Chartered in some state out west. Yes, with himself as the sole trustee for the Institute. Yes, we've checked that. That's right. He was going to send a check for the proceeds of the benefit to the Institute, all right. And be there himself to receive it. He expected to get away with something that wrong? No, Mr. Peters, but he expected to be out of the country by the time it was found out. Well, how far has the organization gone? All the way. Tickets, advertising. He's even got a Coliseum Hall lined up. Now he just wants to line up some more names. I notice he's scaled the prices on the tickets from $10 up to 1000 He's no piker. Well, anything else, Miss Brent? No, that's it. I'm glad it's finished. Yeah, and I guess I'm kind of sorry. What? Well, at least somebody was interested in guys like me. Finding out that disabled guys can do lots of jobs as well as they did before they were cracked up. Jimmy, don't say that. You know, it's funny. The only guy interested was a crook. And now he won't be around. Jimmy, I think he may be. 
For a little while. What? I don't get it, Mr. Harder. When we make an arrest, it's for the good of society. But I'm not sure this case is as simple as that. Why, I don't understand, Mr. Hardy. Well, I may be sticking my neck out. But if we plan the how and when of Dr. Whalen's arrest, we'd be doing a lot more for society than we would by picking him up right now. How's that, Mr. Hardy? I've got an idea that might work if Jimmy and Vicky will cooperate. Oh, anything you say, Mr. Hardy. There'll be some risk. Vicky? I've gone along with you this far, Jimmy. I'll go all the way. Good. Now, make yourself comfortable. I'll tell you my plan. Gee, what a crowd, Jimmy. I never figured they'd turn out like this. The Coliseum's jammed. Yeah, but I'm wondering, where's Dr. Whalen? He'll be here, you stop worrying. Well, Mr. Hardy did swell about this. I'd hate for him to get in a jam. So you don't think Doc Whalen's wise, do you? Jimmy, you don't think I tipped him? Oh, no. No, Vicky. I know you couldn't. What I... What I think about you... Well, a, a guy like me shouldn't. Jimmy? Mm-hmm. How do you know I couldn't cross you out? Tell me. Oh, Vicky, it... Oh, oh, there's Doc Whalen. I guess he just came in. And looking so happy. Hello, Jimmy and Vicky. Splendid crowd. Splendid. Where were you, Doctor? We were getting worried. Uh, just checking up at the box office, Jimmy. Don't you think it's time Gary Marlowe started the program? Yeah, sure, Doc. I'll tell him. Uh, he's right over there. Say, Mr. Marlowe. Oh, yes, Jimmy? You want me to begin? Yeah, right away. Oh, and, uh, Mr. Marlowe, don't forget that first guest. He'll, uh... It'll be kind of a surprise for everybody. How could I forget him? Well, here I go. Good luck, Mr. Marlowe. Going to start, Jimmy? Yeah, yeah right away, Dr. Whalen. Uh, let's sit here close and uh, enjoy the show. Huh? I intend to. We put a lot of work in it. We've all put a lot of work in it, Doc. <laughs> Before we begin the show, there's a special guest I'd like to introduce right now as he has to leave shortly on urgent business. In fact, this gentleman is always on urgent business. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to present the chief of the United States Counter Spies, Mr. David Hardy. Hardy. Jimmy, how did this happen? Special guest, Dr. Whalen. Uh, I thought it was great we could get him. He doesn't make many public appearances. Oh, yes. Great. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Marlowe. Later on, I want to ask you about a trade secret. In those Western films of yours, how do you get 50 to 100 shots out of one six-shooter revolver? <laughs> the counter spies could use a trick like that. <laughs> Seriously, ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to be here. For the purpose of this benefit is of major importance to America. It's wonderful that more and more of us realize that the disabled can take their places as useful citizens. This occasion is to see that they get their chance, not as a charity, but as a right. <laughs> And now, will the organizers of this great event come over here? Both of you. Dr. Hobart Whalen. Thank you, Mr. Hardy. And Jimmy Dover. <laughs> now, I have a surprise for the audience. An actual arrest here on the platform. Ladies and gentlemen, splendid as this affair is, it has one black mark. It was organized by a confident man, a swindler, a crook. This man here, Dr. Hobart Whalen. Jimmy, I want you to arrest him. I'm getting out. Oh, no, you're not, Doc. This crutch is good for something besides treating us. For a supposedly disabled man, wasn't it? <laughs> now, while my assistant Harry Peters helps Mr. Dover remove the 
prisoner, I'll tell you, the audience, why we did not cancel this benefit weeks ago, even though we knew the promoter was a crook. We didn't stop it because the cause is close to our heart. The counter-spies employ many so-called disabled men and women. They hold key positions in our code division, communications, and others. So we allowed this benefit to go on. And you may rest assured that at the suggestion of the President's Committee on National Employ the Physically Handicapped Week, your money will go to a legitimate organization interested in this problem. And now, here is Gary Marlowe with the rest of the show. <laughs> Golly, Mr. Harding, that was wonderful, wasn't it? Thank it you. certainly was. How's Whalen? He's unhappy, Dave. Two of our agents are taking him down to our field office to be booked. Well, then that winds up things, uh, Jimmy. Except for me, Mr. Harding. Yeah. What about Vicki, Mr. Harding? Well, she'll have to testify against the doctor, of course. But will that, that mean... means jail as a material witness? Jail. Of course, uh, if someone would accept responsibility, Vicki could be paroled in his custody. Oh, I'll do that, Mr. Harding. But, Jimmy, you don't... Oh, Vicki, we've stuck together this long... I can stand it a little longer. You can. Okay, Mr. Hardy? Okay, Jimmy. In fact, from the sound of things, I'd say very okay. And by the way, when you find time, get in touch with me about becoming a regular counter-spy. Will you, Jimmy? Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to present the following message, especially prepared for this counter-spy broadcast, by the Honorable Alvin W. Barclay, Vice President of the United States. Today's disabled veterans and handicapped workers have the full support of the United States government in their quest for suitable employment opportunities. The President of the United States has established a special civilian committee to lend assistance in discharging this national responsibility of providing work for qualified handicapped men and women. The response by businessmen, industrialists, and labor officials has been highly gratifying. But we must intensify our efforts so that a war wound or an industrial accident is not a one-way ticket to the sidelines. I ask your continued interest in those handicapped workers presently employed and added opportunities for those seeking work. I urge all Americans to remember that ability is much more important than disability. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Next week's Counterspy case deals with the teenage terrors who worshipped a heel. The stolen loot that was paid for with a wet handkerchief and hard cash. And the underworld mobster who pulled a switch and continued to be a right guy. Be sure to tune in next Tuesday to the case of the Flatbush Fagan on Counterspy. And remember, when your friends drop in, be generous, but be thrifty, too. Serve plenty of delicious Pepsi-Cola. Pepsi's big 12-ounce bottle gives you not just one sparkling glass full, but two. Get a carton of six and serve 12 delicious drinks. Yes, Pepsi is America's biggest cola value. You get twice the tangy taste, twice the refreshment, twice the Pepsi. So why take less when Pepsi is best? Whenever you reach for refreshments, remember... Pepsi-Cola, hit the spot, two full glasses, that's a lot. Lot more value, lot more zest, why take less when Pepsi's best? Tonight's Counter-Spy program originated in New York, was directed by William M. Sweet, dramatized by Palmer Thompson, and featured Don McLaughlin and Mandel Kramer, with music by Jesse Crawford. Counter-Spy is a Phillips H. Lord production for Pepsi-Cola. Enjoy some Pepsi ice cold tonight.